Hi, Sal. Hello. Who are you? Is this Elliot? But what's left of him, yes. You're coming in very clear. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, you know, it's always in, uh, incredibly difficult, as I was just telling our audience, to talk with people uh, who one is so close with, because interviews tend to be so distant, and, and uh, it's strange to do this with you, but we'll do so anyway. Why have you been in England for the past two years? What is, why do you enjoy living there more than America? Well, it happened really by, by accident. You know, I mean, I went out there really to put a project together. And uh, then the project took a little longer than I had expected, and all of a sudden I started really getting into the city, not as a tourist, but as someone who uh, took residence there. And uh, the difference is incredible. I mean, the, the whole lifestyle is incredible. And I've adapted to it, you know, very well, and I'm really digging on it. Be more specific. What about the lifestyle in England is different in London, and, and what about it do you enjoy more? Well, I think the thing that I I appreciate more than uh, I've uh, ever done before, because, I mean, I had been to London before, but never really took the time to, to get to know the city, is uh, an incredible sort of independent pace. I mean, you can determine your own pace. Uh, in that city. Uh, people are really very extraordinary there in that they let you really do your own thing. I mean, that, that, that phrase seems to be overused. But I find in London that uh, I really can live my own lifestyle, my own pace. Uh, the theater is very available. The, the opera is very available. Uh, uh, and it's, it, 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 it always seems like a fantasy to me. It seems like it's the back lot of MGM, <laughs> but it, it really is real, and people do live there, and there's a, a marvelous kind of civilization, uh, which I dig. What about America? What about Los Angeles? Did you find yourself missing the most? Well, the, you mean, what do I, I miss in America? When you're living in England, what, what, what do you miss most about America? Well, I... Uh, people, you know, I have some very close friends that uh, that live in in New York and in Los Angeles. I miss being with them. I I I think I miss also the the kind of uh, um, well, like in Los Angeles, there's a kind of fantasy land. There's a kind of a playland. I mean, that's what I think of Los Angeles. I'm here for like two weeks to play, mm -hmm. uh, and that's marvelous. But after two weeks. All of a sudden, I realize why I left because it's so easy to just play and and not really get your head into anything. The weather is nice, the people are groovy, everything is sort of uh, complacent. Uh, and I personally, I'm not saying this for other people, but I become very stagnant in that kind of atmosphere. Being a New Yorker, where I'm used to a, a, a very strong pace, I I need the kind of incentive to work. Otherwise, I'll just sit back and enjoy all the goodies. So essentially, in in London, it's basically a work experience for you. And L.A., you kind of think of now as the playground. Uh, yeah. Although I must admit that what I would really love to do is to come back to uh, the states or L.A. or New York, um, a winner. <laughs> you know, I mean, I left sort of uh, with my. Uh, hands empty because the uh, work was very difficult for me here. I wasn't really getting the kind of gigs that I wanted to do. Uh, I want to direct, and I've I've had a, a few opportunities to direct, but not enough to keep me, you know, going. And I really would dig coming back to Los Angeles with a film in the can that I directed, and that would be a nice feeling. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the circumstances under which you left uh, uh, Hollywood. Acting bores you now, doesn't it? I mean, you don't dig being in, in movies anymore, do you? Well, uh, I'm bored because the roles are really not that good or haven't been that good. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've sort of played this, the, the, the dope addict, the dope pusher, and the, and the pimp, and the... And the uh, you know, that kind of role for years now. And, and it really becomes very difficult getting up in the morning and going to the studio and trying to get into that thing, especially since I know that I can direct. 
I know that this is what I want to do, and it, it just all becomes very frustrating. So, boring is is not really a fair word. It, it, it's knowing that there's so much more to do, and I'm not getting the opportunity to do it. Whereas in England, so far, uh, knock wood, I've been getting the opportunity to explore areas that um, are a little. Uh, there seems to be resistance in in uh, in the states. Like directing, you know. When you were about uh, 14 or 15 or 16... A few weeks ago. <laughs> it was really happening for you, perhaps more so than ever in your lifetime. You had the million-seller record. You had, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess Dino was just completed about that time. Was that the fondest period of your life in terms of your career recollections? Uh, No. No, it it was it was simpler. You know, it was less complicated in that I didn't really know what was happening, and I sort of went with the tide. And I thought it was going to last forever. You know, um, a lot of money, a lot of uh, uh, groovy people uh, uh, digging my work and all of that, and a lot of exposure and, and, and the whole newness of it all. So I thought that's that kind of thing goes on forever. But I can't say it was the fondest. I mean, I was just sort of going with it because I really didn't understand it. Uh, the fondest, I mean, the, the, the most pleasure I've had in my career was um, when I decided to, uh, to uh, direct a play for the first time. This was fortune in men's eyes. Right. And I was terrified. You know, I, I got the whole production together and... and um, the backers all sort of trusted me and all of that. But when it came to the first day of rehearsals, I was absolutely terrified because I said, well, you know, now I have to really do it. I've been talking about it for a number of years, and I have to do it. And the thing that I feared the most was that I would resent the actors, having been an actor myself, that now directing actors, I would want to uh, not only influence them with my acting technique, but I would want to really play the role. Hmm. And that terrified me. And uh, I thought I would resent them if they gave a good performance. But I, I must say the most rewarding feeling was like on uh, opening night or the, or the few nights after when I was able to actually watch the performance hmm. and to see these young actors. And I remember one actor in particular who was, uh, you know, had never really done very much in the theater. Uh, young man has done a number of films since then, uh, Don Johnson. Mm -hmm. And seeing the performance happening on stage and seeing the audience react to the performances and cheering the actors on stage was such a trip. And it, and it immediately eliminated that fear that I had that I would resent them if they were good. I was so proud and so elated that I said, now I know that I, you know, I can do that, that that job and really get off on it. And that was the most exciting moment in my career. In I interesting. Years. That that experience is more memorable and more important than all of the motion pictures and all of the bread and all of the craziness and excitement of the rock and roll period. Yeah, I, I really have to admit that. that, that I mean, I don't want to in any way diminish the, the, the importance of of my career to me, you know, personally. I mean, I had some incredible moments uh, as an actor, and I hope I still will have incredible moments as an actor. But I have found the key to what really turns me on, and what really turns me on is to direct. What turns me on is to see people, or see the actors that I'm working with happen, uh, to see them, you know, become recognized, and to go on to better things. I remember when when uh, most of the actors in the cast of Fortune and Men's Eyes went on to making films. Uh, I mean, like I was like a kid in the theater when I saw the movies. I said, "Wow, you know, he's really happening, and and he's he's really being accepted by not only the people but by the industry." And I felt an incredible feeling, which I didn't feel when I saw my own films as it, an actor. It is amazing, and we have talked about this on many occasions about some of the people who have had uh, contact with you, either having been discovered by you or helped along in their careers by you, who went on to such staggering and enormous success. That must <laughs> give you 
a tremendous sense of pleasure. Yeah, we're not going to name names, I guess, <laughs> are we? <laughs> we, we? We certainly can, if you'd like, if you'd like to mention some of those people. Well, I, I'm, I guess I'm too modest. I, w I would say that recently the, the people that have, uh, have become recognized in the industry... Uh, uh, out of fortune in men's eyes, Michael Greer became, uh, I think, a, a very uh, well-established actor. Uh, Don Johnson has certainly, uh, you know, done a number of films that uh, uh, have placed him in the industry as a star, and, and is still going on into doing uh, uh, films. And way before, when you and I were uh, just starting in the uh, Hollywood scene. Uh, if you remember very uh, well, I'm sure you do. We, we found a young singer by the name of Bobby Sherman. Uh, I vaguely recall that name, yeah. Yeah, we said that uh, here's a kid who could be a big star. And uh, I remember that I, I put him under contract to my uh, my company, and my agent at that time, who was uh, William Belasco, uh, represented him, uh, who has now become a very big producer. It's interesting. You you fronted the first. You fronted the money for the first Bobby Sherman record. Well, not only fronted the money, Elliot. I produced. It. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what producers do. Yes, <laughs> that's true. I that's mean, true. not only do you have to work. I mean, I didn't know anything about the board <laughs> either. But I, I didn't want anybody to know that I didn't know <laughs> the board. Uh, as a result, the record, his very first record, was good. Uh, we sold it to Dot. And uh, Bobby Sherman then was uh, had a deal with uh, with Dot, mm -hmm. but that record didn't really sell. But it did get him a contract, and then uh, I remember uh, Belasco got him uh, Shindig, which yep. really uh, started him going and all of that. A couple a couple of specific questions that I want to ask you, Sal, because they're things that people are always asking me about you. Um, most people recall you primarily from Exodus and Rebel Without a Cause. What was your favorite role? What was your favorite film? Well, for different reasons, I have favorite films. For instance, uh, uh, just purely as, a, uh, as an acting uh, experience, I would say the role I had in Exodus was, uh, uh, you know, fulfilling as an actor. It had the range, it had, um, it had the guts, and it had all of that. Um, uh, Rebel Without a Cause was my first sort of real experience working with, uh, you know, a heavy, heavy actor, James Dean, and then working with uh, a director that was more than just a traffic director. I mean, he really sort of made the whole experience uh, um, more than making a film, which very seldom happens, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, today. Uh, and then at a sheer, you know, for sheer pleasure and enjoyment, uh, a film that really wasn't a very good film, but that I enjoyed making because of the circumstances was a, a film called The Gene Krupa Story. Mm. Because I had to learn to play the drums, which was a good excuse to work with Gene Krupa for about you know, two years. And I really got into the drums, and uh, unfortunately the film wasn't as good as the music. But, you know, these are different reasons why I like different films. What is... What is the the most outstanding memory or recollection you have of James Dean? The thing that comes to mind first upon me asking the question. Um, I think the, the, the thing that, that turned me on most uh, about Jimmy, the thing that I think about the most, uh, uh, was his, his uh, influence on me. Influence in that, in, in working with him, I, I began to understand the craft of acting as a craft rather than a um, uh, um, you know a job or a, um, a means you know I mean he really did some incredible things and as a result we had to keep up with him hmm. um, I also remember the last time I saw him um, and we had talked very very heavily about directing and, and uh, something that he always wanted to do, and, and his whole feelings about directors. He had worked with some of the, the best. He worked with Kazan and, and Nick Ray and, and George Stevens. Was he very much uh, in real life as he was on screen? Was he the, the silent, dark, kind of rebel, withdrawn, stranger person? Yeah, I think all of those things 
came through, but the one thing that I think that has been misinterpreted all of these years was this sort of bizarre death wish, um, you know, uh, connotations that, that always seem to surround the name James Dean, and, and that's a lot of nonsense. I mean, I don't, I never bought that, and I still don't buy it. He was shy, which a lot of people misinterpreted for being aloof. Uh, he was terrified of people, you know, um, and couldn't really deal with, with being with a lot of strangers. And this is why his friends became, you know, increasingly close, and, and he became very dependent, you know, on his friends because of that. Uh, and it was just, you know, the, the, the sad part of it, it was just getting really tight and we were becoming close and there was a bit of an age difference. And his last thing was, you know, I'll see you in New York. And um, he split and he was going on to this race down, I guess, in San Diego, wherever it was. And that was the last I saw of him. But the, the memory is there. The influence has always been there. Uh, also, I'm... Uh, I know that that we haven't seen or, or had the impact that James Dean gave us um, since his last film. I mean, I can't think of another actor since James Dean that has had the same kind of effect on the industry and the people. Nor can I. Do you think it would be appropriate <clears throat> on the radio to tell the Brandon DeWilde story? Um, I, I, I tell you what, I don't think it would be. I, I, I think that because of Brandon's death being so recent, mm -hmm. that there may be people who would uh, who are still sort of suffering the the blow of his his death, and uh, you know it's difficult when you talk about someone who has just sort I of understand. left us. You know, have, uh, there have been a number of printed reports that on occasion you have attempted spiritually to communicate with James Dean. Do you ever feel that you uh, you were able to fulfill that? Oh, I'm sure I have. Through through Ouija boards, essentially? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes without, you know, just sometimes, uh, just silently. Uh, the, the the contact has definitely been made, and, uh, and the presence, you know, uh, I have felt, you have felt too, you know, a number yes. of times. Uh, the, the the thing that that always happens though is uh, I know is whenever I get into raps about seances and and spirits and and all of that kind of thing is that um, because it no longer amazes me because it no longer you know is like a phenomenon I mean I I've just learned to accept it that it does exist is that uh, I usually find that people when they first s sort of hear about it or hear me talking about it, get into this whole kind of prove-it-to-me thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just can't get into that anymore. I mean, it, it, when you have to start... It, it was like Louis Armstrong once said when somebody asked him, uh, you know, uh, how do you describe jazz? <laughs> you know, he says, man, if you have to describe it, forget about it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's the, the same kind of thing. Sure, I've, I've, I know that my experience is... Uh, have actually occurred. Uh, you know they have. Yes. Few people in our circle have, have experienced these things. Uh, Brandon did, definitely. Uh, and unfortunately, um, um, the, the areas that we can't go into are the things that I mean about discussing um, um, the spirits and, and uh, also, you know, playing with spirits, as a lot of people like to do. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I think that it's very dangerous. This whole thing of, of prove it to me, you know, uh, is a definite no-no. Uh, <laughs> so I'll only keep you for another uh, few minutes, okay? Oh, I'm having a ball. <laughs> I'm sitting here uh, very relaxed in sunny California and, and enjoying it. Um... Do you kind of resent the circumstances under which you left the city and that your ability as an actor, as a director, uh, was uh, tremendously appreciated and acclaimed in Variety and The Reporter? The reviews on your play were wonderful. It ran in L.A. and New York and Hawaii and San Francisco. Yet it was always so difficult, in fact, uh, impossible for you to convince uh, the studios to uh, to direct one of your projects. 
Did you do you still hold uh, animosity against them? I, it's not animosity because there's nobody you can really direct it at. I mean, it'd be different if I could say, "Oh, you MGM, you won't give me a job," or "You, uh, Mr. So and So at Columbia, you won't give me a job." It I, I can't single out uh, what the problem is. What it is is that it's disappointing in that I really. Uh, uh, my career happened here. I mean, all of the tools were here when I first started. Uh, I know a lot of people in in, in this town, and, and I dig a lot of people. And the thing that, it, it's like, uh, you know, when you can't happen in your family, it's a disappointment. And you feel like you want to prove to your family that you are, you know, a together son and that you are worthy of uh, all of the things, that, uh, all of the education and the love and all of that that they've given you. But isn't that the case? You, you usually have to split from the family and go elsewhere hmm. uh, where, uh, you know, they, they accept you really on... on on your own, not in your own terms, but on different terms. It's not so much a personal thing. It's more of a of a business thing. I mean, for instance, like in London, nobody has asked me, you know, how do you know you can direct a film? Because I, I, I want to direct a film, and I am preparing to direct one. But here, I, I usually get that, that thing of... Um, uh, you know, well, we know you're a good actor, but uh, what experience have you had in, in directing a film? And I said, well, I've never directed a film, but I've, you know, I've been in the business 20 years. I've directed stage and all of that, and it's, that was successful. So it's not really any different. Mm. It's disappointing, and th that's why it would be really a groovy trip for me to be able to come back, you know, one day soon with a with a film in the can that that is good, and be able to say, not here, I told you so, but just say. Uh, you know, I'm back home, because hmm. <laughs> I like it here. I, I just have a few brief, specific questions for you, and then I'm going to let you go. Uh, how do you characterize yourself in terms of your religious beliefs? Do you consider yourself a religious person? Uh, religious in the sense that uh, I definitely believe that there is a supreme force. There, there must be. Uh, but I, I don't sort of... Um, believe that it is really in any specific religion. You know, I mean, Just I was raised a, uh, a Catholic and um, went to a Catholic school for a number of years, but I, uh, I, I can't honestly say that I, I buy all of it, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, the older I get, the more turned off of any kind of organization, you know, whether it be religion, whether it be... Uh, you know, these groups, these sort of uh, nationality groups. and um, that, was, that was my next question to you. As, as a, a person of Italian ancestry and origin, there was a great deal of talk when The Godfather came out and all of those mafia-related films uh, from uh, Italian organizations that it portrayed uh, people of your um, ancestry in a negative light. How did, you, how did you react to that kind of comment? Well, I don't think that The Godfather portrayed uh, the Italians in a negative light. I, I, I think, if anything, The Untouchables did, because The Untouchables made the the uh, Italian uh, uh, mafiosi or Italian gangster as being, you know, very dumb and that they were easy to, to capture and they re really weren't a threat, you know. But, I mean, in, in all of the... the, the actual cases of, of, you know, the, the Al Capones and the Lucianos and the, and the people of that fame, they were uh, pretty intelligent people, and that's why they were dangerous, <laughs> hmm. you know? Uh, uh, but, I mean, I, I just don't buy all of this, uh, you know, uh, we are Italians, so we must stick together, or we are Jews, and we must stick together, and, and all of that. That's, that's nonsense. Uh, um, I mean, I think that only promotes uh, prejudice, uh, I, uh, you know, when groups clan together that just promotes uh, uh, antagonism. I agree with you. Has there ever been a time in your life where either drugs or alcohol became an uncontrollable problem for you? Were you ever deeply involved in, in any of those? Oh, I managed to control them beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a time in your life when you were tremendously into the booze or, or dope? No, not 
not beyond a, a point where I mean it was it was leading my life. I mean I've I've tasted and experimented it, uh, with it all, but it never really overtook my life, and it never will. You have you have tried just about all of the popular drugs. Yeah, I would think so. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, I'm I'm curious by nature, and always will be. Uh, if if a thing sounds like it, it could be an interesting experience, whatever it might be, or whoever it might be, uh, it's I think worthy of at least you know the benefit of the doubt. If you could uh, uh, point your finger at one particular existing problem or situation uh, in America that you would like to see altered or remedied or changed in any way, if you had that power to alter a situation, which situation would it be, and how would you like to see it altered? Well, I, w I would love to eliminate, especially from young people now as they're growing up, because I think it's too late to do it with, with us oldies, <laughs> but uh, as, as young people are growing up, I would like to see competition eliminated from their um, conditioning, but without eliminating the incentive. For instance, uh, you grow up and the folks say, you've got to go to college so that you can get a better job. I would like to hear you should go to college because you would enjoy the education you know, eliminate the rat race, eliminate, you know, Tom has got to beat Harry uh, or competition within the families amongst brothers and sisters and all of that. Uh, eliminate the Olympic Games, eliminate that kind of, you know, connotation where you must beat your fellow man in order to be recognized, in order to be successful, and in order to be happy, because we all know, because we've all been there, that it doesn't mean that you're going to be happy when you beat the next guy down and you're better than he is at whatever the thing is that you're doing. Uh, but again, without eliminating the incentive to want to do great things.